terrific number of plenaries today and we've all been eagerly awaiting yours. Um, by way of introduction for those who might not know, um, Saskia is the Robert S. L. Lind Professor of Sociology at Columbia University and she's a member uh, of the Committee of Global Thought, which she's chaired since 2009 to 2015. Um, Saskia uh, Sasson is a renowned, renowned sociologist of globalization, a prolific author, an outstanding thought leader, and a woman of action. And her works are really outstanding. Um, I'll just name a couple because they matter. Uh, the mobility of labor and capital, still as important as ever. The global city, which I gather is a term she uh, coined. The sociology of globalization, and importantly, and ahead of the game, digital formations, new architectures of, of uh, global order. She's won many awards for her uh, scholarship and her contributions to society. And today, the title of her presentation is De-Theorizing in Order to Re-Theorize. So over to you, Saskia. Okay, thank you for that very generous introduction. And I must say, I am delighted that you asked me to come and that I can uh, get to talk about this work that I'm doing now. So, so the title is De-Theorizing in Order to Re-Theorize. So I'm not throwing theorization as it exists out of the window. <laughs> I'm just saying that we must also capture new elements, new transversalities, especially one of the big issues for me right now is to how we overlook transversal conditions that run from actual you know, material conditions to questions of how we think uh, we move through our societies, et cetera. So from the, from the very parochial, local, et cetera, to the more abstract. Um, now, this, the, the title of this, of this text is uh, sort of tells you a bit, huh? de-theorizing in order to re-theorize, not to throw it out of the window. Um, and one just very brief, let me say, abstract introduction, just to make us all sort of be on the same page, is you know some elements here that the current global age that took off in the 1980s has actually unsettled many of the major social, economic, and political meanings of the preceding Keynesian era in the West. Now, I emphasize the 1980s, not the 2000s or whatever, the 1980s. The 1980s for me marks the, if you want, the culmination of a series of transformations that were happening, you know, since World War II, one could say almost. Um, now, my concern is particularly with the major categories we use in the social sciences, economy, polity, society, justice, inequality, state, globalization, immigration, and I could go on. <laughs> and I'm sure that some of you have some very nice ones that I should be adding to this list and you will help me. Uh, now, these are all powerful categories that explain much about the realities they represent. However, those realities have mutated. And so you have, you have these, 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 uh, these analytics you know, that actually capture a lot. But in the meantime, history has moved on. And so you know, I, it's, it's in that in-between space that I situate uh, you know, my, my, my sort of analysis, if you want. So those realities, I repeat, have mutated. A first move in research from, from where I do research uh, is to posit that we need to discover what these major categories veil or obscure about our epoch precisely because they are powerful. In my own work, I have sought to show that the national and the global are powerful categories that hide as much as they reveal about our current epoch. And so does their mutual exclusivity. You know, this is also a feature that is quite important. When you look at how Chinese do the equivalent, you know, mythologically speaking, though with their own terms, et cetera, uh, mutual exclusivity 
careful. Huh? It, it's, a, it's a very significant element that is not often in play. A second key move is to cut across the knowledge silos we have generated over 50 or more years of research in the social sciences. Um, so, so again, I just want to make sure that it's clear. So, so for on the one hand, I had sought to really show that the national and the global are powerful categories that hide as much as they reveal. And that and, and this stuff about their mutual exclusivity. Huh? And then the second key move is to cut across these knowledge silos. That is really what I'm working on now. I want to really position myself not inside those knowledge silos, which are very useful, by the way, very good, very well done. They keep growing, they keep adding, etc. But my concern is not to be inside of those silos, but to be in the in-between space. What has the making itself of these very full concentrations of knowledge and you know devices, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what has that then left out that is also still there? You know, and that is that also that is still there that interests me. So my image for me is often, I want to stand on dead land. I want to stand where the waters are dead because we let them die. And so we don't even bother about mentioning that as part of our current reality. Of course, if you're an expert on those, of course, you're very involved, but you know, many people just don't. So that is a bit the notion. Am I speaking loud enough or too loud? Is it fine? It's clear? Okay, great. Okay, very, very good. Uh, now, one critical feature uh, of the current phase of capitalism is a proliferation of systemic edges inside national territory. Now, clearly I, I pick up on this because that is what I'm interested also in, in, uh, in, you know, in, in analyzing. So I, I conceive, uh, hang on a second here. Uh, so one critical feature of the current phase of capitalism, I repeat, is a proliferation of systemic edges inside national territory. That's very important point to me. And that leaves then these, these dead zones. Dead, not, not because there is no more life in them, but dead because they're completely forgotten, because they're not operational, you know, a, a series of elements along those sides. So, and I can such systemic edges as the point where a condition takes on a format so mean that it cannot be easily captured through the standard measures used by governments and experts. And I think that is a very important point, you know, that I want to really work on much harder, etc. The key dynamic at these edges is expulsion from the diverse systems in play economic systems, social systems, biospheric systems, etc., etc. Thereby, what lies beyond such an edge becomes conceptually and analytically invisible, ungraspable. Each major domain has its own distinctive systemic edge or edges. Thus the edge is constituted differently for the economy than it is for the biosphere or for the social realm. This is also something that we should really be working on. This is something that we have sort of neglected. Huh? Uh, type of edge is foundationally different from the geographic borders of the interstate system, you know, which is still in many ways the dominant map that we have. The core hypothesis for me is that we are seeing a proliferation of such systemic edges originating partly in familiar conditions. Among these familiar conditions, we can see the decaying Western style political economy of the 20th century. It's now a very familiar one to us. The escalation of environmental destruction and the rise of complex forms of knowledge that far too often produce elementary brutalities. The expulsion logics I focus on are just a few of the many that might exist. They are generally more extreme than whatever expulsion logics existed, for instance, in the preceding Keynesian period. 
And this is a very important point to me, you know, that when I look at brutalities and expulsions in our current system, really something that starts for me, you know, clearly in the 1980s, uh, and I compare that to how the preceding period, which also had grabbers and thieves and people who didn't care about all kinds of important issues in a city, for instance, and it was different. It was, it was just lighter. It was not as brutal, I think, as it is now. Now, you don't have to agree with me on that. It's also that I am looking at particularly uh, egregious abuses of law, of, of power, of good water, you know, the abuse of mother nature in all its many manifestations. So when you begin to look at that, <laughs> you know, there isn't much uh, that, that, that is good in those situations. Um, so, so anyhow, these expulsion logics for me are also evident, of course, beyond the West, as I argue particularly in a long chapter uh, on environmental destruction that, that is in expulsions. And I call that chapter dead land, dead water, no commas, no nothing like dead land, dead water. And, and I like to just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. I will not subject you now to that. Um, now, second sort of element, the need to develop new instruments for analysis. So in my earlier work, and you know, I've been around for quite a while, I developed methodological and conceptual elements to cut across the weakened categories developed in the 1950s for studying the interstate system. So I wasn't keen on destroying or on showing all the, the bad things of that earlier mode of thinking methodologically and conceptual elements, but I see them now as weakened categories. And I think we should recognize that, we should work with that, we should transform those categories in less weak categories, et cetera, because they are still capturing a truth. Uh, now here, one thing that I'm thinking about is the weakened categories that were developed in the 1950s, for instance, which in the 1950s produced quite good stuff eh, for studying the interstate system. So I identified a variety of vectors that allow one, anybody who is interested, to track processes, whatever their geographies. So it doesn't depend just on a geography of a certain type. Thus my intent there was not to contest the weight of interstate borders, but rather to study how a given process scales globally. And that to me has now become a fairly important point, this whole notion that there is a kind of scaling that is happening that is not always visual. And that of course then winds up internationalizing or expanding act or F or whatever, not just over a city, but over a whole country, et cetera, et cetera. Thus my intent there uh, so I identified a variety of vectors that I repeat now that allow one to track processes, whatever their geographies. Now, I wanted to come back to this because I love geography and, and geography, I think of myself a bit as a geographer, but I like also this notion of identifying vectors that allow one to track processes whatever the geographies that are involved, rather than just tracking along with the existing geographies that we have recognized. Thus my intent there was not to contest the weight of interstate borders, which is a, the common move, but rather to study how a given process scales globally. What are the instruments of the law, the economy, the social, the cultural, etc that have been and continue to be developed to enable the making of cross-border processes. That to me becomes a very important question. One result of that inquiry was the idea that perhaps the critical question marking the contemporary period is not so much about the weakening of interstate borders as it is about who has the power to make new types of borderings. In other words, not the border in the traditional sense, 
but all kinds of modalities of borderings. Current work on the systemic edge, for instance, the work that I've done in, in the book of expulsions, uh, and also on the importance of situating ourselves, to me, this is very important, of situating ourselves at the fuzzy edges of a paradigm rather than in the strong center. So in, in my book, Before Method Analytic Tactics, I represent sort of, I try to understand an additional conceptual instrument uh, by, by emphasizing that kind of aspect. It does not override or contest the earlier work that I have done. On the contrary, it often builds on that earlier work and takes it further, both theoretically and empirically, by calling for the need to de-theorize, to go back to ground level. That now has become a very important move for me. When do I have to exit the analytics and go back to ground level? And ground level can be dead land, dead water, putrefied zones where one could actually grow food if, if, if a government enabled that. You know, a whole mix of elements. I'm really <laughs> going sort of transversal in terms of all these different uh, options and things. Now, so, so, so coming back to this, you know, the importance of situating ourselves at the fuzzy edges of a paradigm rather than in the strong center in before analytic and before method uh, represent for me an additional conceptual instrument. So I think of it as yet another tool, you know. It does not override or contest the earlier 1991, 206, et cetera, work that I've done. On the contrary, it often builds on that earlier work and takes it further, both theoretically and empirically, by calling for the need to de-theorize to go back to ground level. You can tell that this is now really my baby here. I really like talking about that. Uh, so, so, that it, so, so that we can see what are the new alignments. I see a need to de-theorize in order to re-theorize. It's not to, in order to throw away theory, but it's to re-theorize. For instance, uh, in my work, I compare a highly polluting industrial complex in Russia where I was, horrifying, absolutely, and one in the USA, and ask what matters more to understand the current period, that one has a long, in this case, the, the Russia, that one has a long communist trajectory and the other a long capitalist trajectory, or what matters today is that they both have vast capacities to destroy the environment. Now, inserting the environmental question here serves to triangulate what is otherwise a mere comparison that uses conventional variables, capitalism versus communism. So, so I hope that this was clear. In other words, I'm trying to exit the simplicity of capitalism versus communism, but I want to work with both. So I repeat, so inserting the environmental question here helps me triangulate what is otherwise a mere comparison, capitalism versus communism, that uses conventional variables. Doing that, taking that move, enables a third knowledge space to emerge. You know, it sort of creates a zone that can become visible is another way of Thereby, it helps us go beyond traditional comparisons. We leave behind the Cold War and organize our research and interpretation in terms of what is urgent or meaningful today, with the environmental question representing one such significant current issue. This kind of third dimension takes on specific contents and meanings depending on the domain or variables that I want to focus on or somebody else wants to focus on. For instance, I explore the growth and privatization, privatizing of prisons in the USA and the growth and privatizing of refugee camps all over the world. Both grow and both have increasingly private sector interests at work. This is extremely important. I think by now most, most uh, people know this. Huh? that there are private 
enterprises, very powerful ones that are deeply embedded in all of this. Um, my question then becomes, are these two very diverse formations with such different specifics actually systemic parallels, in other words, systemic parallels, each adapted to its particular environment? Now, this is a methodological and interpretive practice that continuously recurs in my expulsions book, eh, that I'm continuously engaged at that level. Uh, it, I must say it helped me, it opened my eyes to all kinds of things. Now you have to tell me by when I should stop talking because I can talk very long and we don't want that. Um, you have at least, you have another 10 minutes or so, uh, 15 minutes, it's fine. <laughs> 10 minutes, wow. <laughs> 15 minutes. 15. No, okay. I, I, will take I don't want to cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> Furthermore, the extreme character of conditions at the edge helps make visible what may also take place via more moderate instances inside the system. A bit less equality in the earnings distribution or the small symptoms of climate change we experience every now and then, you know, a whole set of issues there. In the spaces of the expelled, in the spaces where the expelled live, we find far sharper versions from middle classes that have lost it all to dead land and dead water. In this regard, I conceive of the systemic edge as signaling the existence of conceptually subterranean trends. In other words, there is a whole other logic in play made in part by people, but it's not the logic that we researchers think of or capture or that the government captures, etc. It's something that emerges precisely from that other condition, a condition that for most of us is fairly remote, actually. We, we can't even imagine what it means to be in some of those systems. Um, now, in this regard, again, I conceive of the systemic edge as signaling the existence of conceptually subterranean trends. That for me is very important that the systemic edge is, uh, 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 how to put it, is an item that is part of, can recognize, can contribute to, wants to kill a whole range of differences, the conceptually subterranean trends. Now, if you think of any very militarized society, that is exactly what's happening. They don't want something that they cannot control. Now, from there, then, the importance of positioning my inquiry at the systemic edge. I cannot be in the middle to do the work I do because the middle is the middle is the middle. I have to be at the edges because the edges are often what is left out, what we don't know, et cetera, et cetera. So it is the edge, but I call it the systemic edge, huh? uh, where a condition can take on its extreme form and in that process also escapes the more conventional measures and representation. So that for me, that systemic edge is a very valuable element that has strong negatives and strong positives, but the strong positives have to be worked out. And so mostly researchers will not necessarily focus on that. Now I'm going to give you, can I have another two or five, two or three minutes? Yes, of course, of course. Oh, okay. So a key source in my reading of these expulsions is a mix of elements often experienced and often admired as requiring specialized knowledges and complex organizational formats. One example is a sharp rise in the complexity of financial instruments. The product is a product of brilliant creative classes in advanced mathematics, that often winds up destroying healthy non-financial firms. But the whole question of that to me, I've done quite a bit of research on it. I mean, the financializing of everything and the extraordinary modes of knowledge, you know, very advanced math. To me, this was absolutely, I started working on this five years ago or something or even more, but really it is stunning. Another one of these entities is the complexity of the legal and accounting features of the contracts enabling a sovereign government 
to acquire vast stretches of land in a foreign sovereign national, nation state. This is now a major scandal worldwide, the extent to which uh, we, the West especially, has enabled the buying of all kinds of land, etc. cetera, uh, us as outsiders. So yeah. Now in my work, I explore the extent to which we have reached a point in our advanced political economies where complexity today tends to produce brutalities. And those brutalities are not complex, they are elementary. Now, elementary also means that there is a sharp constitutive element in there, a strong constitutive element. So that to me is also sort of a major, uh, a major issue that we need to confront. And I finish now um, with a final short little statement. So what is expelled from the system, from situations, etc and the conditions of those expulsions, that can vary greatly. This is one reason why it is not easy to see these diverse expulsions as emerging from shared emergent dynamics. Right? So, so these, diverse, these are very diverse expulsions, so we cannot see that. They're actually emerging from shared emergent dynamics. In other words, a set of powerful actors that are cutting across everything. It used to be that say the, the housing of poor people didn't matter. Not, not, not the housing, but say the buildings where you had a lot of poor people, that didn't matter to the big investors. Today it matters because they don't make it work as housing. They make it work as assets. So it is a house in our eyes becomes an abstract instrument that can be bought and sold many times over. And it can be a truly disastrous little house and it can make money which has nothing to do with people buying the house. It has to do with the materiality that is involved. Anyhow, I think maybe my time is up. Am I right in thinking that? <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Um, Mary, did you wanna ask the first question and then I can read out other questions that we have in the chat after that? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Saskia. That was very insightful and all those concepts that you put together are pertinent to our time. But there was one concept which intrigued me, and that is that notion of scaling. Could you give us an example of what this scaling, you know, which the cross well, that's scaling. Right. <laughs> that's great that you ask that because scaling is actually much more than just scaling the, nowadays, the way we think about it. Because scaling sounds so neutral and it sounds smart, it sounds what can be wrong with scaling. Hell, a lot can be wrong. So in this case, what I was just saying towards the end, the little modest houses that we may think, or, or these, these housing complexes, which have a lot of very, very modest households, et cetera. And we think, well, what are we going to do with that? You know, nobody, you know, the rich are not going to bother with that. Well, a lot of investors are buying those housing nowadays. Why? Not because they want the housing. They want the materiality. Because when you have algorithmic mathematics in play, you have reached such a level of abstraction that it is no longer about the house is the house. No, the house can become an asset that you can buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell many times. And the asset really comes in the shape of the materials involved, not the house. So that is one very simple uh, explanation of you know, how, how also how complex reading where the abuses are in our system has become, because that is the other part of the story. No, it's not easy to understand. Did I help a little there or not? Yes, uh, but you spoke about it in the context of globalization. Uh -huh. uh, that, and I was curious about an example of scaling as a new form of globalization or a, you know, well, alternative way of thinking about it. Yeah, well, let me, let me mention, uh, uh, a, a couple of items. I mean, the fact that we have seriously, I mean, extensively and seriously uh, <coughs> um, um, uh, broadened the domain within which we can function in very abstract modes. In other words, a modest house can now be part of that, but it's not about the modest house. It's about the fact of that 
here is a materiality that exists and it can be bought and sold, bought and sold, bought and sold many times in a day. You know, that is one very simple way of saying it. That is terrifying, you understand? And that explains, for instance, why one of the greatest, greatest, richest men in the United States, I will not name him, he has been buying up a lot of these, these big buildings, you know, you have mostly poor people, and he's done this in 33 countries. Oh, yeah. Just buying that up. Why? Because the materiality. So yeah, there, there will be a house, you know, and they don't destroy the houses, but they transform that into assets that are an abstract notion. Right. So our shoes can be part of those abstract, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very, it gets a bit weird. Once you read a lot about it, then you, you see that there is actually a logic. It's absolutely stunning. It's a horror. I get it. I get it, Jessica. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the next question we have is from Habib. Um, it's 1.30 a.m. there in uh, Abu Dhabi. So I'm going to read his question so we don't disturb his family too much, hopefully. Um, uh, it, the question here is, how is the concept of edge different from the idea of liminality that others, and then in brackets, anthropologists have used? Well, that is a very interesting question. And this, the first thought that comes to mind, since I don't have two hours to really examine it, you know, uh, the first one is that you can take it in many directions. And I want to emphasize again what I just already said, is that in many situations, uh, the object is secondary. What matters is there is an object. What is the quality of the object? What is the nature of the object? Can we use it? Does it have a broken leg? Secondary. What matters is that objectivity, that practicality, that, that thing that exists that you can buy and sell. Increasingly, moreover, you're buying and selling stuff that has been made into an abstraction, even if it exists you know, as a building. But it is in the abstract moment that the stuff happens. You mean, this is really look the the this is really the logic that physicists have brought into finance, and physicists are simply brilliant, and they are not the bad guys. They love experimenting. They love inventing. They're just absolutely extraordinary intelligences, also peculiar intelligences. So that is sort of one way of answering that question. And I already talked too much, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is um, from Nancy. Nancy, did you want me to ask your question or would you like to just unmute to ask your question? I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can go ahead and read it. It says, uh, do you see a relationship between the complex knowledge you address and yeah, the various... Sorry, oh, there you are, Nancy. Captain. Sorry, I'll let yeah. you do that. Okay, only because I might be able to shorten it a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Also, I apologize for the external noise, but um, yeah, the um, Saskia, when you were talking about complex knowledge, what came to mind for me, and I'm wondering if you see a relationship, is that I've seen these waves over the decades, the early 70s, you know, with the UN Conference on the Human Environment, and then, you know, there was this whole right to development, so then we had UNSAID after that, and then we had the crisis, if that's a euphemism, of humanitarian assistance, where suddenly humanitarian assistance came under fire. And then we have uh, second generation peace building initiatives that now there that's be be come under fire as well. And I'm wondering if there is this kind of layering where there's a segment of the population and it's usually the elite population that is trying to address some of these global problems but we find that it's not as simple as it seems, and a lot of a lot of stakeholders, a lot of people, or a lot of people who are affected, are left out of the decision making, and that's part of the problem with any of this that's addressed. And I'm just wondering if you see a relationship in that pattern since the really since the late 60s, early 70s, up until now, in the context of this con complex knowledge you're talking about. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely, I, I see that. And, and you are right in emphasizing what you emphasize. And again, my, you know, there are many ways in which this happens. But what marks it every time is that it uses 
whatever element X to produce a Y that we had never thought could be produced that way. You know, there is something in play with these new technologies and with algorithmic mathematics, you know, the sort of a combination of elements that really marks sort of a new period in our history confronting, you know, all these various things. And, and I, I don't know if I am explaining, and, and it is sort of, it's so weird, you know, this is weird stuff in many ways we could say, but, um, but the fact, for instance, that is why he's, that is why I mentioned the example of this, this guy, this big entrepreneurs who keeps buying these big housing complexes has bought 33 in different countries. Uh, and it's not about the housing quality. It's not about, it's, he will make them work and he has to fix them up to make them work. But the main draw that he gets is that he can put it into the financial markets as a commodity or as you know a valuable kind of instrumentality whatever it is and that is what i'm always trying to push my students to understand that we have really entered a new epoch when it comes to finance when it comes to complex systems it's partial but my by god it is really serious stuff and the winners are super winners I mean, it's an extreme, we, we can see that, you know, I, you don't need me to say that, but we really are seeing it also. I'm sorry that I, I shouldn't be talking so long, I know, but I hope that I clarified a bit. Yes, and that, that thing you, you you said at the beginning, the sort of, I, I, I may not be paraphrasing correctly, but that unintended consequences, you know, things that we did not imagine would come out. You know, yeah. like what's wrong with post-conflict peace building? What's wrong with humanitarian assistance? What's wrong with saving the trees? You know, like what? what, what but at least that backfires, and it, yeah. it it has caused this chaos. I know I'm not supposed to like respond to your response because we don't have time. But thank you. Yes, yes, that definitely. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks, Nancy. Uh, the next question we have is from Bill. Bill, did you want to unmute yourself to ask your question? 